I was thinking that we'd start, I ask you questions, and you answer yes or no. Were you the mastermind that cheated the Olympics? Yes. Today, the World Anti-Doping Agency suspended Russia's sports drug testing lab. 99% of Russian athletes are guilty of doping. It's worse than we thought. If this is true, it is an unimaginable level of criminality. I was helping to facilitate one of the most elaborate doping ploys in a sport history. This goes all the way back to 1968. Every sport was Putin aware of the existence of the Russian doping system? Yes. We are top level cheaters. This all can be proved. It's quite mind blowing. New York Times is breaking tomorrow. Tomorrow. It has the potential of affecting the credibility of all sport. Why would I watch an event that's fixed? You in any danger? Yes. Oh, I need to escape. Putin will kill me. Holy shit. Putin calls the claims the slander of a turncoat. Two people connected with the Russian doping program are already dead. There never was anti-doping in Russia, ever. Ura. Be very careful what was your recording. Thanks so much for being here. How's your day going so far? Uh, well, it just got better. <laughs> Yeah, you watch that trailer again, and man, it's it's so beautiful. I mean, what was it like seeing that trailer for the first time? You know, this is your film. You know, uh, it, as a filmmaker, you're always concerned about what the trailer is going to be, and uh, that's where you start relinquishing control. Um, and uh, and I, you know, there's a lot of threads in the film, as you know, and and a lot of the film is kind of my journey that to what gets to that story that unfolds in the uncovering of that scandal. But I think the trailer is great in that I think it hooks you and it's yeah. exciting and makes you go, wow, this looks uh, really messed up. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, <laughs> yeah, exactly, very messed up. I mean, you mentioned I got a chance to see it a little bit earlier. I mean, it, it's breathtaking. I mean, it's completely thrilling. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, a scripted film, a narrative, you know, obviously there's, you know, there's turns, there's twists. Um, but usually in a documentary, you kind of know what you're getting when you're starting the project as a director. You know what you want to do. I mean, what did you start off this film trying to do? Uh, something entirely different. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could have never imagined when this film started that um, what was kind of initially my super size me journey to dope myself. And I believe that the anti-doping system was essentially kind of a, a, a fraud, that it didn't work. Because I was a, I've been a lifelong passionate cyclist, but filmmaking and writing and creating is how I've made a living. Mm. And I was looking at the Lance Armstrong situation, and here it is, January 2013. And he's confessing to doping, mm. but behind the story, the guy had never been caught. Yeah. To this day, he's still passed 500 anti-doping controls clean. Yeah. And I'm going, wait, 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 is this Lance Armstrong's fault? Or is the system completely inept? I mean, if yeah. they can't catch the most tested athlete on planet Earth, yeah. I mean, who can they catch? Yeah. So the idea initially was, hey, I'm gonna basically turn myself into a amateur Lance Armstrong, and I'd always, I'd always been riding, <laughs> and I was gonna dope myself like Lance, yeah. and I was gonna find scientists and advisors and doctors to tell me exactly what to take, when to take it, document the whole thing on camera, go into these big European uh, amateur races that kind of like mimic like the Tour de France, except for uh, amateur masochists. Mm. Um, <laughs> And, yeah. and show essentially the, the world that the anti-doping system still doesn't work. Mm. And if this was the case with Lance, I mean, forget about cycling. I mean, what does this mean for every sport, every Olympic sport, and yeah. baseball, and football, and soccer, and basketball? And, and so that was the initial idea. And I get connected to Dr. Rachenkov Gregory in Moscow, and 
At the time, he's running the third largest anti-doping lab in the world. And you guys, you, you, he wasn't the first guy you reached out to either, right? He's, he got connected after through another mutual friend, right? Right. I got connected. I had, um, I had approached all these other people. And most of them are like, yeah, this is a great idea, and you're 100% right, and uh, the anti-doping system does not work, but I'm not going to be on camera right. uh, showing you how to do this. They are worried I, about their jobs. Because I, I would lose my job, essentially. Like, uh, even though I'm a scientist and I know exactly what to do, and, and I can tell you that, yes, you can get around the testing, I'm not going to be the one to tell you how to do it. Uh, but, you know... Uh, I guess thank God for uh, for for Gregory, yeah. and um, you know, he's like, yes, yeah, this sounds like a fun idea. <laughs> I mean, your first your first Skype call that you have in the film is incredible. Yeah. I mean, he's like shirtless and his dogs yapping in the background, and he's joking around with you. I mean, what was it like when you first met this guy online? I mean, you know, we had we had been messaging, we had been emailing, we had been um, uh, having phone calls, and then you know, we have this call, and he had actually. Um, uh, it was very soon after Sochi, after the, the Sochi games, and there he is, and yeah, and he's shirtless, and he's like, oh, so you want to be like Lance Armstrong? I'm like, yes. He's like, I can help you. <laughs> Your Russian accent has gotten better, I'm guessing. Yeah. So uh, I think it has. Yeah. Either that or it's gotten worse, and it's just become a caricature of a Russian accent. But, um, you know, and, and once Gregory was on board, I was like, wow, this is, this is crazy. This guy who's who's running the anti-doping lab for all of Russia yeah. is going to tell me what to do, how to dope, bring my samples into the lab. And yeah. all of that was against the rules. I mean, 100% of that he shouldn't have been doing to begin with. And, and so I'm like, wow, what, what am I going to do when, when I'm kind of done with this movie? And, right. and we had established this friendship. And, you know, and I told him, look, you know, we'll, I'll come to Moscow. I'll show you the movie, mm -hmm. and we'll figure this out. And then... Uh, Lo and behold, I mean, he turns out to be Edward Snowden, yeah. literally. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, you saw this performance that the Russian team had in Sochi, and you're thinking, this is a huge windfall. I get to work with this guy that's working with these athletes. Um, when he's putting you through the procedures, when he's helping you, he's helping you do the injections, that sort of thing. It's a lot of rough scenes for, for people who aren't comfortable with needles, you know, might be a little uh, queasy. But, uh, I mean, you're injecting yourself how many times a day? I mean, how much, what are you taking? I was taking a, a lot of different things. I was taking, I was taking testosterone, uh, which uh, highly recommend. Um. <laughs> Do you have any with you, or you brought, you brought some for us? I mean, I, no. I mean, you're performing uh, incredibly, so I'm kind of like, yeah. as a guy, I'm like, yeah, I would love to. Um, no, I mean, you know, because I mean, after you're, you know, basically after you've hit about 25, your testosterone just starts going like this, and then. And then it just drops off a cliff. So, yeah. but I was taking testosterone. I was taking uh, HGH. Mm -hmm. uh, I was taking EPO, erythropoietin, to increase your uh, red blood cell mass. Uh, I was taking DHEA. I was taking thyroid, which is, increases your uh, metabolism. And then I was taking all these different vitamin cocktails, and those were really painful, right. uh, like these B12 and folic acid. And I was there was a I was just uh, constantly injecting myself. Um, <laughs> And there was a lot of times where I'm like, this is just insane. What, what am I doing? And I've got a camera set up as I'm just jabbing myself with needles. I'm like, this is... This I mean, you had a little stupid. fun with you, right? You were, you were talking about, you know, injecting yourself in the, butt, in the butt with a couple of your colleagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, and, and, you know, and I'm like, my thighs are getting all these bruises. And he's like, no, 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 stop it, stop it. Just shoot it right into your ass. <laughs> so, I mean, he's such a character. I mean, how did you feel when you're on this program? I mean, it's very similar to what Lance Armstrong was doing as a guy, you know, were you feeling the difference uh, physically? You know, um, I, I, there, there's such a kind of, a, I, I think, a misperception in society of PEDs, this idea of performance enhancing uh, versus training enhancing. And there's also a real difference between hormone replacement, which is kind of what's going on in like the whole anti-aging uh, business and what most athletes would be doing versus like anabolic steroids, which are, you know, jacking you up. So... The biggest difference though, is the recovery. Mm -hmm. And so if you can recover, you can train harder the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that you know, the human body generally works is you're going like this. So you do a, a five hour effort and the next day you can do four and a half hours and the next day you do four hours and that's you know, the attrition especially of endurance sports. Mm -hmm. But if you can recover, then you can do five hours and the next day you can do five hours and 10 minutes and the next day you can do 515 and so you're actually getting stronger and so these 
you know, hormones essentially are helping your body recover, which allow you to, over time, get stronger. And that was, and that was certainly a, a big difference. Um, but I think it also kind of calls into question um, what is it that we expect of society of our athletes? Um, why do we have this moral dilemma that they're going to take something to recover to do their job better, mm -hmm. which they're being paid tens of millions of dollars to do? Right. Um, hypothetically, if Peyton Manning took HGH, let's say, and I have no idea if he did, why are we upset about this? Right. The guy's being paid millions of dollars to play football, <laughs> and he has a surgery, so he takes something to help him recover so he can go back and do his job that he's being paid to do. Why, why, why are we upset about this? Yeah. And so there's, there's, there's so many questions that the film really brought up for me on a on a deeper level that I didn't expect as I was going into it. Yeah, I mean, you found after you did that program, you actually didn't have a, as great a performance as you did before you did the program. I mean, so that was a little bit, of, I'm sure, a dilemma as a filmmaker, because you're wondering why you did that, you know, why you went through the program to begin with. Well, at that point, um, I thought uh, my, my film uh, was, was over. Yeah. I mean, it was... Uh, it was effed. I mean, I had, I, had, I had spent all this money and time in two years, and I had went back and done this race the second year, and I yeah. and actually hadn't done technically better. Yeah. Um, but I had recovered, mm. and so it was hard to kind of show on camera, even though the results weren't showing that, mm. that I felt completely different. I was actually, like, ready to go for another week. I mean, had the race been 14 days instead of seven days, I would have, you know, I was, I was getting stronger. Um, but I had, you know, mechanicals and stuff. And at the time, I was I was pretty depressed. And uh, then I went to Moscow to meet Gregory. And uh, shortly thereafter, everything took a, a major turn. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is your expert. You know, he's a talking head in your film. And then he mentions while you're on camera, uh, did you see the film about me? I mean, that 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 first documentary that hit yeah. in Russia. I mean, what was it like for you as a filmmaker to go and watch that and know that you're talking to this guy that's involved, might be involved with something that's a lot bigger than what you work on? Well, it, it, it was, I think in some ways, it's a, a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker's dream, but all of a sudden your subject or the guy who is going to advise you and, and you know, be your expert uh, is involved in something pretty serious. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was like, oh my God, this, this, is, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, I also knew that at that point, if, if I turned into an investigative journalist, if I started basically going, hey, what is this about? What did you do? What is this? That, that I would lose him as my advisor. And I felt at the, at the time that the film that I was making was going to be, you know, um, explosive enough, was going to be cool enough that I didn't need to turn into his investigator and that I would allow that to take its course of action, which it did. And then because of our friendship and our trust, um, the film was able to take this spectacular pivot when all of a sudden you know, his life was in danger and he was telling me that he was going to be killed. Yeah, I mean, he truly became a friend, obviously, through this process. And what was the first moment that you realized or the first time you're with him or speaking with him that you realized, oh, this is a lot bigger than I first perceived? You know, uh, it, it was, it, there were a lot of steps in the process. But, of course, uh, essentially November 9th, 2015, this report comes out and it's alleging that he's, uh, the mastermind of Russia's state-sponsored doping program. But they still didn't really have the evidence. They didn't know about the urine swapping at Sochi. They didn't realize about the, the urine bank that he was holding 16,000 clean urine samples of athletes from all over the world that had competed in Russia so that they could swap it for any Russian athlete at any time. So, you know, so, hey, it's a swimming competition, and they matching the steroid profile, and he goes looks into his database and pulls out another athlete's sample that matches that and goes, okay, this is, you know, it was, it was it sounds diabolical. Uh, yeah. It, it was, it was, uh, I mean, unbelievable. And then you go, wait, if, if they, if, if Russia was capable of doing this, mm -hmm. um, what else might they be up to yeah. in regards to perhaps our current administration or, or what's going on in the world? Um, but so, you know, when, when, when that had happened, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm turning on the television, and there it is. I mean, it's CNN, it's ABC. I mean, it's worldwide news. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like, 
there's the guy, and I'm Skyping. FaceTime, yeah. And I'm Skyping with him, and he's like, uh, Brian, Brian, I had to resign today. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. And, yeah. and, and Putin gets on state television two days after this. This is now like um, November 12, 2015, and Russia is denying everything, as, as always, and uh, saying that none of this is true, but more importantly, that, that the responsibility is going to be individual and absolute, and those are Putin's words. Yeah. And at that point, I, I, I said, well, uh, Gregory's, Gregory's gone. Yeah. And um, you know, the, the next day, there, there we were on Skype, and he's like, I need to escape. Yeah. Uh, and he had two FSB agents living in his house that were technically guarding him. Right. And the KGB, main, formerly known yeah, as KGB. KGB, yeah, FSB. And, uh, and uh, you know, they were basically planning his suicide. And uh, I got him out of there, put a, put a ticket on my credit card. He had a visa because he had been lecturing here. And then he arrives in Los Angeles, and I still had no idea at that point what he had perpetrated, what he had done. And then that came out over the next couple months, and it was uh, it was a really really intense time, really intense time. I mean, there was obviously a lot of uh, terrible things going on in Russia. Some of his colleagues, um, you know, uh, passed away, uh, quote unquote, as the Russia was saying. Yeah, I mean, what was it like to be in the room while he's finding out this news about his family, his friends in Russia? Uh, you know, it was it was really uh, really intense, and a, a lot of sleepless nights. I mean, not only had the film completely pivoted, and I'm going, wait, um, the movie that I thought I was making, I can essentially throw all of that out because this is the movie. And, and I had to reimagine exactly what that film was going to be and how to tell that story. And at the same time, you know, it was how do we protect this person? And so I went from essentially being a filmmaker uh, into helping him get legal counsel and helping him get immigration support and helping him get crisis managers advisors and and like one of the guys that that we bring on I'm I'm reading in you know the New York Times yesterday is the same guy Mike Citrick who's advising Trump's lawyer Kasowitz today and I'm like I know Mike Citrick <laughs> he's the guy that was advising us when when my guy is uh, uh, in trouble and and um, so it, it, it was uh, it was a it was a really really stressful time because I also was spending my entire team and resources then went away from the filmmaking and turned into essentially researchers and I brought on Russian translators and we had these hundreds and hundreds of documents that he had got out of Russia all the evidence and were and we're transcribing these and putting them into spreadsheets and organizing them essentially to figure out how to bring this story public yeah. and how to bring it forward and that it could be substantiated and corroborated. Yeah, I mean, speaking to that, you actually have, obviously in the film, you have documentation about how you guys went through the process of how you were gonna share the story. You know, obviously, as we know now, it was a big New York Times story. Everybody should read it, obviously. And then you were also negotiating with the DOG, the Department of Justice, about what was gonna happen with Gregory. So how did you sort of uh, bridge that gap? How did you, you know, obviously he's risking a lot by coming public about this. Well, there was, there was, a, there was a point. Um, that it's now essentially March of 2015, and the Department of Justice had shown up. The FBI shows up in the middle of the night, knocks on his door, serves him with a grand jury subpoena, and our government at this point doesn't know what I know. Right. They have no idea. They just know that this scientist is not in Russia. He's all over the Russian news. The FBI is obviously like, who's this guy? They realize he's in Los Angeles. They track him down. They knock on his door, and they go, here's a subpoena. We're going to find out what you're doing here and what you know. And the, the biggest thing was is everything that I knew at that point about WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and how they had handled investigations and what they were capable of doing. The IOC, the Olympic Committee, which had zero... Uh, 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 
uh, a ambition to uncover this. I mean, this was the destruction of the Olympic Games, not Sochi, right. but this is the destruction of Olympic history. I mean, if they're operating with honesty and, and integrity, you essentially wipe out every single Olympic medal that has ever been won since basically 1968, right. because we now know that every single, you know, medal that was run won by Russia uh, is is suspect. So what does that mean for the rest of the, the rest of the world for the rest of the Olympic Games? I mean, it's like a it's like a do over if you're being honest. So I mean, the IOC this is this was the last thing on earth that they wanted uncovered, and then I'm sitting there going, well, what is our government going to do with this information? Mm -hmm. Are they going to bring this forward? Are they going to go after, you know, Putin and Mutko? I mean, really? Mm -hmm. Are they going to start this start this war? And so. Uh, we knew that, that we had to get this story out and because it was what Gregory was wanting to do. I mean, he, he, he had risked his life. He wanted to tell this story and there, was, and there was a point where it was like, okay, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. And we made this decision that we needed to go to the New York Times and, and then myself as a filmmaker would follow the journey of the dominoes that fell after we went to the New York Times, and then I was still in the middle of it all behind the scenes, but that we couldn't let WADA, the IOC, the United States government decide what they were going to do with this evidence or this, or this story. Yeah. I mean, there was obviously shockwaves after that report hit, and then now, because of you know, that bravery, Gregory is in witness protection, correct? Protective custody. Protective custody, okay. And there's, and there's a difference. So he's been there for a year, and essentially our, our government is still kind of not knowing what to do. And I think that, that the film really shows that, uh, that what Gregory did was pretty heroic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the concern that, that I have is, uh, as both a, a, a citizen of the United States and as a filmmaker, and you know, in this case almost an activist, is that if our government were to take action against somebody like Gregory who is this whistleblower, and a whistleblower on the level of like an Edward Snowden, that what does that say for anyone else on planet Earth that wants to bring information forward about their government to the United States? And so it's an incredible risk for our country, I think, that if we were to take action against Gregory, you're essentially saying the United States is no longer a safe place on this planet where if you want to report the crimes of your country and what, you, what they've been up to, to come to to do that, because if you do that, we're going to prosecute you also. And so I'm very, very optimistic that, uh, that, that Gregory will be okay, and I think that the, the movie shows clearly uh, how brave his actions were, because had he not come forward with this information, there was no one else on planet Earth who had this, period. Right. Nobody else. Yeah. He was it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and he chose to, to bring this forward. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he did. Uh, I have so many more questions for you, but we have some actually in the audience, so we're going to start right there. Hi. So I was wondering what you thought about um, the IOC not placing a total ban on Russia when this all came out, and then also do you think it's going to change in the future, like their testing processes and whatnot? Well, those are, those are two different questions. The first is what I think about the IOC, that they didn't place a, uh, a blanket ban on Russia for the Rio Games. And essentially, the only ban that was upheld was for the IAAF, the, the international uh, track and field, all of athletics, and that had nothing to do with the IOC. Um, it was a spectacular fraud. I mean, you literally have the president of the Olympic Games standing in front of every athlete on planet Earth going, be fair, uphold the rules, be clean, respect the Olympic ideal. And the Olympics goes around planet Earth preaching yeah. that this is what an athlete should do. And then they are presented with the biggest, most spectacular, most outrageous fraud, scandal, criminal wrongdoing in sport history. And they had a moment. And that moment was ban Russia from the games. And it was an obvious decision. It wasn't even like a, how do you not do this? It was, 
uh, here's 1,700 documents of evidence. Uh, they literally have been defrauding the Olympic Games for 40 years. Not only that, in Sochi, they committed pure outright criminal fraud, breaking into the bottles, swapping out dirty urine for clean urine. Uh, it, literally a masterminded organization with the, with the KGB, the FSB involved in agents. And then you let them go into the Rio Summer Games? I mean, what does that say to every athlete on planet Earth? It basically says, go ahead and cheat. Mm because the Olympics don't care. Uh, so it was, it was unf unfathomable. And then you have the question up of the Winter Games right now. And there's still talk that you're gonna allow Russia into the next Winter Games. How? How do you do that? I mean, are you kidding me? After, uh, after you have uncovered and forensically and scientifically proven what was at stake, what message are you sending to every single athlete on planet Earth if you actually want the Olympic Games to continue, if there is any point in the Olympic Games, which is a whole other question because of the human life's costs and the financial costs of essentially these cities that host the Olympics. But, you know, it's, uh, it, what you saw there was you saw uh, essentially a corrupt organization protecting itself for its own financial goals and its own financial endeavors and essentially a group of whatever this is at the IOC that controls the IOC, a bunch of really wealthy older men protecting their billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars business instead of taking a positive ethical stance against what was a spectacular corruption. Um, so that's my opinion on that. But in, the, in regards to anti-doping, that's a more difficult question. Because the thing is, 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 do you ever believe that sport can be clean? And I liken that to kind of, do you believe that Apple will be putting out an iPhone 8 sometime in the next <laughs> you know, six to nine months? And do you believe that a year after that, there's going to be an iPhone 9 and an iPhone 10, meaning that we have medical technology constantly advancing. We have science constantly advancing. And humans are not done evolving. And so just as we're trying to beat cancer and just as we're finding cures for Alzheimer's and all these other disorders, it's the same thing with enhancing your athletic ability through you know, through making your body create more erythropoietin naturally or making your body create more testosterone naturally. So the question is, is how does this cat and mouse game ever end, especially when there's billions of dollars on the line? And yeah. I don't have a question, and I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's another question back there. Hey, Brian. Uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, as a filmmaker, how was it, um, how was it for you, like, trying to, you know, make this you know, documentary without being emotionally invested in uh, the subject matter? Uh, you can talk a bit about that. Well, I, I was emotionally invested. Uh, I was deeply emotionally invested. And, um, uh, and, and, it, and it came from a friendship. I think, you know, my, uh, my, my film um, is very different um, than so many documentaries in the sense that I think um, most documentary filmmakers, you're, you're setting out and you're going, okay, hey, I'm going to go make a documentary on Steve Jobs and I'm going to just stay neutral. And I'm just going to report what I find, and I'm just going to, you know, eventually maybe I'll take an, an objective that I like what Steve Jobs did here, I don't like what he did there, but I'm going to essentially tell this, this story as best as I can as, as a filmmaker and as a journalist or, you know, whatever, whatever that is. Um, this was a different situation because I had gotten not only personally involved, but I never thought that... Gregory in the beginning was going to be the subject of my documentary. I thought that he was going to be essentially my advisor and the facilitator on my own journey. And so when the story pivoted and, and all of a sudden he is not only the subject, but his life's in danger, um, it was no longer about trying to protect this line between filmmaker and subject. It was we were on this this journey together and it was and it was, you know, very personal. Um, you, and you've seen him since, and you've remained friends, and you saw him recently, I guess? Well, I, I haven't. Uh, he went into protective custody a year ago. Um, I haven't been able to see him. Um, I've been able to check on how he's doing. Um, 
um, through his legal counsel and seeing that he's okay and I'm hearing that he's in good spirits. I'm hearing that he's, uh, you know, optimistic uh, and feeling, you know, very positive in, in the decision that, that he made to bring this story forward. And, um, and I do know that he was, uh, that he's seen the film uh, and that he really was moved by it. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, uh, he's got a hard road ahead of him, and I, and, uh, I hope he's going to be okay. Yeah. We have one last question. Hi. So when you were taking all those drugs to experiment for the movie, how long did it take you for your body to go back to normal? Um, well, I mean, going back to normal would mean that I going back to not as good as I was, <laughs> uh, essentially. Um, you know, it, 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 it's interesting because, you know, everything that I was taking was essentially hormones, which your body actually produces anyway. So you're, uh, you're really just enhancing what your body already makes. So when you go off of it, it's kind of a very, very, you know, subtle thing, but... Um, you know, it, it's not like it's not like one day you feel like Superman, the next you don't. It's just, it's just one day you're you're taking HGH and you're recovering a little bit. Um, and uh, I was told uh, that I smelled like a baby. Um, <laughs> but I guess my body was uh, making you know growth hormone, which is how a baby smells. Um, and then the next day, or five or six days later, I no longer smelled like a baby. So, um, <laughs> but it, it certainly wasn't a radical, uh, 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 you know, a factor that I feel like it had changed radically. Do you think there's a follow-up uh, to this film? You think you're going to do another uh, documentary around Gugri? Um At this time, I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't have access to him. Uh, right now, I mean, we have to see what plays out over the next, you know, year kind of with this story because there are so many dangling threads to this still. I mean, this the story is still in progress, which is they're still retesting samples and and disqualifying athletes. They're still deciding whether or not Russia goes to the next Winter Games. They're still deciding whether or not Russia hosts the next, um, you know, World Cup, the next FIFA World Cup, and. Uh, which is a whole other thing because Gregory was in the planning stages for next summer's World Cup to do exactly what they did at Sochi to, you know, to do for the World Cup next summer, but that's been, you know, uh, kiboshed now. Um, and then there's, you know, still the lingering questions of the, you know, of the Trump administration and, and what's going to happen with that. Um, so... You know, I, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I just came out of this journey of three and a half years, literally finished the film six weeks ago because we kept working on it after Sundance for another four months. And so I'm not thinking about making another documentary, at least follow up to this at the moment. That might change in, in a couple months. But Well, I highly recommend everybody check out Icarus. Uh, Netflix, August 4th is when it hits. Tell all your friends, absolutely watch it. Thank you so much for being here, Brian. Give them a Thank round you. of applause, Thank guys. you for having me. Thank you.